All right. Happy Sunday to you all. We're back here with James Larson, and he just finished a review of a new company, speaker company that probably you guys don't know too much about. They're from Korea, and they're called Mon Acoustics. And James had the Super Mon Mini bookshelf slash desktop speaker. James, I see it right behind you. That thing looks pretty sturdy it does not look like a typical wooden cabinet it looks like something machined out of you know for the military why don't you give us a rundown of this speaker your experiences and guys don't forget we have a written review that's in the description below that you could go and look at all of his measurements and analysis and listening tests but i thought it'd be great to have a little discussion here with james directly by um, his experiences with this product and give you some insights that maybe you won't uh, get just from the review itself Hey, hey, Gene. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's an unusual speaker, to say the least. I mean, I haven't really reviewed anything like this before. It's um, all metal speaker. Um, Mod Acoustics is kind of known for that. Um, there's actually a lot of companies in Korea. Um, Korea, there seems to be a fad in speakers in Korea where mm. the cabinets are made all of, of metal, like aluminum or whatever, you know. So like, and Mod Acoustics is one of these companies. And um they kind of want to bring that to the United States and um it's it, it's a really beefy little speaker it's it's a ex little expensive but I mean for the build quality it's like unsurpassed for a small speaker it's just a, a, a aluminum chunk basically I have another one right here it's like um it's it's all aluminum. it's really it's really heavy right for a small speaker and yeah. um it's like it's it's just solid as a rock, you know, or more than a rock because rocks aren't made out of metal. Um, yeah, but we do we do have a slideshow presentation. I guess we can go through that to like uh, go into. Yeah, you know, the one thing that really caught my eye on the speaker, and you can't really see it in your background too much, but when the light hits it and it has that purple baffle, I, I like that. I mean, it kind of, if the Joker had a speaker, I think this would be his speaker, right, on his desktop. Maybe I think that's probably a little too tasteful to be the Joker speaker, but yeah, it's, it's a nice speaker. But you can get these like so the back and front of these speakers are you can have them anodized, uh, like dyed, uh, like a whole lot of different colors. And this this one was like a lilac type color, color, um, mm -hmm. or lavenderish or whatever you want to call this, kind of like between pink and purple. Uh, it looks really nice, but you can have a, a, a range of, range of colors. I think it's an extra hundred dollars for like custom colors. So like yeah, it's it's a really cool looking speaker, really nice looking, and the build quality is really second to none. And just so you guys know, this is not like a budget product. I think these are what about two thousand a pair. Yes, they're two thousand a pair. They're they're a luxury item. They're priced like it. They're built like it, and they look like it. Okay, well let's dive in deeper and see what's involved in this. So they're pretty small. They're only about eight and a half inches tall. Yeah, they're small speakers. They're like meant for like a desktop or a really small room. Um, but you know, a really nice one. So it's it's an unusual speaker. Not in that it's just has an aluminum cabinet, but it's uh, it uses isobaric woofer design. It has a really high crossover point. Um, it's it's crossover point is something like 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 near seven kilohertz, like six seven kilohertz. And, yeah, because you're using a full bandwidth driver basically on that mid. Yeah, it's basically a full bandwidth driver, and the, the super tweeter is the, the, the tweeter is almost being used as a super tweeter. Most two-way speakers, this is a two, really a two point five way. Most two-way speakers are using um, you know, the, you, you'll find the tweeter being crossed over at like maybe two point five to three kilohertz, maybe a little bit above. So by by crossing this one over so much higher, at like near seven kilohertz, that almost makes this like almost a, like a a very wide band um, woofer with almost like a super tweeter like use. But I mean. Not quite, but almost, you know. But what the really um, I mean, other um, unusual design characteristic is the isobaric system. So you see that woofer on the front. That's only one woofer. There's another woofer behind it, and there's like they close like a sealed cavity between them. I mean, I think going going on in a slide, there is a uh, there's like a schematic kind of explosion. Yeah. View that so, ba so basically, it's a compound load. It's two one woofer behind another, and it acts like a super woofer. So they don't have to use a woofer that has a much longer throw, which can t potentially have more mass and maybe not play up as high in frequency, which they were trying to get. They were trying to get this woofer basically to play the critical mid range without having to have a crossover point in it. So they use something that has high bandwidth 
you know, a driver that doesn't have a lot of mass. And that's why they went with the isobaric base loading, right? Um, yeah, well, it, it's also just to get as much extension as possible because like what isobaric uh, loading does is it makes the, like the, the woofers only see like, um, like half the space that they normally do. Right. So like there's no, so the, when the, the woofers and, and the cabinet are, they both have the same amount of pressure on one side of the, the woofer, right? So that means there's like no back pressure on the front driver, which is it's almost moving like freely. Which, which means it can play a much lower. It doesn't see the, the internal. It's a small cabinet, but it doesn't see that small cabinet. It's like there's no cabinet at all. So it plays much lower. It has a much lower um, a resonant frequency in a small cabinet than it would otherwise. And, and you really yeah, need I mean, that with these speakers because they're so small, right? To, to get the same FS, you would need to double the cabinet size. And when, you, when your cabinet's made out of aluminum, that's really t that's tough to do, you know? So, like, you know, yeah. there's... There's a lot of different reasons why they did that. And I think it was a good idea, the isobaric system. I haven't really dealt with a speaker that does that before, but it's pretty cool. And it was a I've seen design. subwoofers that do the isobaric and with, with mixed results, some of them better than others. But yeah, I mean, basically, this is a tiny bookshelf desktop speaker. And the thing has got usable bass extension down to 65 hertz. And it's got a pretty decent sensitivity, uh, 88 dB. That's at 4 ohms. So probably a little bit lower if you're considering it at 8 ohms, right? I did my, that my 2.83 volt measurement was a little bit below 88. I think it was like 86 point something. It was just like pretty high sensitivity for a four inch two way. Yeah. It was like very good, very good for a four inch two, um, 2.5 way. And like most mm -hmm. small speakers have nowhere near that. Like most smart speakers, are like eight, I mean, 80 DB, 81, 82 in that realm, not, yeah. not 86. So that's, it's really good. And there, there's a packing it came in um different it, color it, options for the baffle so the actual draw the cabinet itself is always that brushed aluminum but then you have a choice of different baffle colors yes you know, the back and front have different colors and you can have you know like i said it's just modest like 100 fee it's, it's a pricey speaker but when two thousand dollars an extra hundred dollars to get the color that you really want it's not not much but um yeah um so i guess going to the next slide um i i yeah, there, there's a close-up of the tweeter. It's using an AMT tweeter and, and this kind of a, a really s steep waveguide. There's on the back of the tweeter. You can th that's a really big port for the size of the speaker. And you'll yeah, get a better look at it in the, in the exploded view. Um, there, there's a, see that, that the marking, that like print on the back of the speaker there, that's actually laser etched. That's kind of cool, you know? Oh, that <laughs> is cool. Yeah, so it's like such a heavy duty little speaker. Um, it really looks nice. Um, and the, the port is very, it doesn't have to, they don't have to have a, a small port, I guess, on account of the isobaric system that, you know, to get a lower resonant frequency, you need a, a smaller kind of port size in, in a cabinet like this. But, um, of course that would, that would cause port shelving at any kind of like, you know, higher volume, but with the isobaric system, you can have a large port and, um, that works, you know, you, so you get, it, it's relatively high output speaker for the the you know size of the speaker yeah i like the fact that the port is flared so that helps cut down on any chuffing noise or anything like that it, it, it's more than just flared i mean a lot of ports are flared this port is shaped as an elliptical shape and that's really good for, for for port chuffing i wish more companies would do that actually most companies just use like a straight cylinder maybe put some flares at the end but um the research has shown that when the entire port is shaped elliptic elliptically um, both both JBL and uh, Bose kind of discovered this. Um, you get it's, it, it just functions a lot better for, for um, you know limiting port shopping. But in this port, this speaker kind of has that shaped port. So you, mm. you, you could, I think in the next slide we'll show the shape of the port better. Yes, there's the exploded view. See that port? It's not like a straight port. It's oh like yeah, yeah, shape. yeah. And that's like that's a that's a very good port design. I mean, and it's also, it's a relatively large port, as you can see, considering the size of the speaker. And there you can kind of see the, the two woofers. One is kind of midway in the cabinet, you know. Um, on the left side, we see the, uh, there is not a lot of empty space in this. Look at those, look at those capacitors. And, and huge parts, yeah. And inductors, yeah. It, it, the, the entirety of the, the, like, this speaker is filled, right? There's not a lot of interior capacity or interior, like, space in the speaker, which is another good reason why they went with the isobaric system. Because they're just, there's not, there's not a lot of space. It's a tight cabinet, you know. So the isobaric system was really necessary. It was, it was a good design decision, but and a necessary one to get the, mm -hmm. 
to get the speaker to do to do what it's doing. So yeah, it's, it's a heavy duty, really heavy duty cabinet. I mean, really well built. It's it's a small speaker. It's pricey, but it you get your you get your money's worth because it's the build quality is really out of this world. So is the cabinet more inert than an MDF cabinet being all aluminum like that? Or does yeah. it ring when you, when you knock on it, it doesn't ring, right? It's really solid sounding. It's, yeah. You can, yeah, it's, it does not ring. It does not, it's, it, this is solid. I mean, that it, it's heavy duty. It's solid. It, 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 for some reason, they still put like damping on the inside of the, the cabinets, even though I think they, they just did it just cause right. It's kind of expected, but they didn't need to because it's like solid metal. This is not sheet metal, right? It's, yeah. This is solid, heavy-duty, like extruded aluminum for the side panels, and the the front and back panels like milled chunks of aluminum. Right. It's it's like, it, it's heavy, man. It's it, you know, it's not. There's no ringing on this at all. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I like again the attention to the detail. Look at the parts. I know there's a debate often about do you really need to have the more expensive or better parts, and my engineering hat always says go with the best parts you can over design always and obviously they're using very low tolerance parts here they're using air cores they're using poly caps they're not using electrolytics so i think you said in the review that the speaker will probably outlive the owner yeah it could it could very well outlive <laughs> the owner yeah i guess we can get to that it has a generational speaker it really does I, I i guess we can you can touch on that now um so everything's aluminum there's like no wood there's nothing here that can degrade the the cap uh the capacitors are film capa metal film caps like big old mundorf caps there okay the only soft parts of the speaker i guess aside from the damping which really don't make a difference is um uh, the amt is not going to have any soft parts it's not going to degrade but the only soft parts is the suspension on the woofer but since only one half of that um suspension is exposed since there's a, a sealed cabinet uh, cavity between those two woofers right it will only age half as fast, you know, uh, due to like humidity and stuff that mm. a normal woofer would. And the, it's already going to last a long time. And if you Yeah, really well, butyl, butyl rubber suspensions last forever. It's not like the old days where you get the foam with the dry rod either. Yeah. And if you really want you, I guess you could put that like um, that stuff that makes rubber last if you wanted to treat it a little bit on the, the, the um, surrounds. Uh, Steve Feinstein mentioned you could do that with these. And like... um. They, they just they could not last decade after decade this this will never die this speaker if you take care of it right it will outlast you so it's like a, so someone's with, asking if the ribbon tweeter is open on the back or is it a it's not it open it's on the back okay, no, rib, so ribbon tweeters, well it's not a ribbon tweeter it's amt i mean and true yeah those designs seldom are open on the back i don't i don't think i've ever seen one open on the back yeah this is a heavy duty crossover um it's, it's just really well made so yeah Someone said you could use an inline filter and run them with a sub to help them out. Yeah, and you talk about that in the review as well. If you want, if you definitely want true full range sound, because um, these things can play pretty loud, you definitely want to get some help with a subwoofer if you're in, you know, anything other than a desktop environment, right? Yeah, I mean, the sub helps them out, but if they're they're a good speaker, if you don't have, if you're, you're in a, like a really tight office space or a desk space and you just don't have room for that, these are a pretty good um, solution. So like you can run them without a sub. They don't they don't do deep bass. Obviously, you can't uh, with a small speaker like this. But um, they do mid bass pretty good, and um, yeah, a sub would help. Yeah, they just they'll give you. Well, so this bass. might be one speaker that crossover guy can't change the crossovers on because where how's he gonna go up from there? <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, I, he could always try. I don't, you know, the, yeah, there's something he could do maybe. I don't know. Okay, here's the here's the testing condition. The test of the speaker. Um, it was a nice day out, obviously, and like that, we tested it up in the air, so there's no reflections. Actually, there would have been some reflections in this testing because the speaker's so small. See my platform on the yeah. side at 90 degrees and past, there would be some reflections that would have gotten in the measurements. So this isn't ideal testing, but if, for the first, for the uh, front like hemisphere of the speaker, this is fine. For the back hemisphere, you would get some reflections from that platform, but. It wouldn't be a huge deal, right? Because it's just base back there. It's just, mm -hmm. So it's not like it's, it's longer than than the uh, it's, it's too long for the reflections to be like a big deal. But yeah, so and just to clarify, clarify for anyone that's a new viewer of Audioholics, 
James takes a lot of effort to take the speakers outside to measure them in a very consistent manner to take the room reflections out of the equation. He puts it on this platform so you can measure it on axis and at various different angles so you can get, you know, kind of like a power response and just see all the off, off axis response of the speaker. He doesn't do the listening on this platform. He's not listening to the speaker outside. He's doing the measurements outside to remove the room factor. That way, every speaker he measures is under the same test conditions, and you're actually getting the response of the speaker and not the room interactions with the speaker. Yeah, yeah. This that, this test conditions it allows me to um, measure the speaker without any acoustic reflections getting into the mic. So, like, that's why we do this. Um, it, it, once those reflections get in, you don't have like an anechoic condition, and you can't measure the speaker itself. You're measuring other things, the the environment around the speaker. So, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I, we don't. Po I didn't post the whole measurement suite for the speaker in the review too. You know, usually I post like for bookshelf speakers like the Spinorama type, you know, measurement suite and a bunch of other stuff. But this, it does. It kind of defies that. It's intended usage. It doesn't work for that sort of like um, measurement. That, that that sort of graph, right? It, it, it would it would lead you to like I know that some uh, make some like I don't know bad assumptions about the speaker, and it's not proper. So like. I just I just posted these these polar responses. Here's the uh, the um, horizontal polar response uh, out to 180 degrees. And I don't normally post this, but for this I will. Um, so you've got I think that's like a 30 degree spread up to uh, at the tweeter's bandwidth and above. But you can see it has a pretty um, wide dispersion at five kilohertz and below. Yeah. And that's like most of the music, most like frequencies like most content is like five kilohertz and below. So it's like, it's kind of a weird mixture of like narrow dispersion and wide dispersion. I mean, not too narrow, but like up to 30 degrees, you want to be within a 30 degree angle of the speaker. But um, yeah, so like that, that waveguide, it constricts the tweeter's output, but the woofer, the woofer is actually has a very wide dispersion and the tweeter kind of narrows that. I mean, and, and a desktop environment, I don't think that's, a, a, that's all that, that that directivity mismatch is such a like a a terrible thing, but it's not ideal. It is not ideal for a hi-fi loudspeaker to have this. But I, I don't. I think for the the type of use this speaker is getting, it's not it's not a big deal. So like it becomes the, less of an issue when you're listening in a near field environment, basically. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. It's like the the uh, reflections aren't there as much in a near field environment. You're gonna have like I I would say in a near field blah, 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 a near field environment the Vertical reflections play um, uh, a great, uh, more of a role than they would normally uh, uh, versus the horizontal reflections. So, and mm -hmm. I think that the next slide shows the horizontal. Now, now here's something oh, that's vertical now. This is yeah, the last this, one was horizontal. This, well, yeah, well, the last one is hard. This is the vertical reflections. And um, you, you do get some weird lobing in the, I think it's because the, the, that waveguide isn't really that optimized. So, on, so in the tweeter's bandwidth, um, you see some weird lobing stripes. And um, it's, it's not easy to hear, but I mean, if you listen at different heights, I think you can hear this. It's not as stark as it looks on this graph, but it does kind of change the sound character when you're adjusting, when you're listening at different heights. And so this is a speaker that you kind of want to like find the right altitude or, or the, right, the right angle of the speaker, the right vertical angle of the speaker. That'll change the the sound of the tweeter a little bit the highs and so didn't you didn't you say you want to be either 10 degrees above it or 10 degrees below the tweeter yeah by by my measurements yeah that, that helps um i think that you get a fuller sound that way it's not a huge dramatic change but it is a change and so like it's something to experiment i think if this is a flaw in the speaker that i, I think the waveguide is causing these like kind of this lobing pattern that um that changes the the sound of the tweeter a bit depending on the altitude or the, the vertical angle of the speaker. So that's something to consider. But I mean, that's that's easily addressed. Just change the height of the speaker or the, the angle of the speaker a little bit, and that'll that'll fix that. So our, our, yeah. you can just voice it to your preference. If you want like a milder, like a more with a laid back tweeter sound, you can just you know change it to where the, the tweeter is a little bit more recessed, and it'll change the, the character of the tweeter. Here's the, here's the low frequencies. I, I don't, you can't do that testing in that free air. I, I put this yeah. on the ground and the mic on the ground, so there's no reflections. So you get a good base response with this sort of testing. And um, as a decent response, there's a hump at like a, like a bump at like, a, I guess, 150 hertz, right? And uh, it, 
this is a like a, a sound character. A lot of small speakers have that. I, I'm not really a fan of that. It, a, this is okayish. The, okay, Mon Acoustics prescribes that you place a speaker like about like seven to eight inches off the back wall, right? Like like a desktop environment, you like you would, right? And that'll shore up the the mid bass, or not the mid bass, but like the deep bass. It will give you some gain, boundary gain. Um, so it you you would get more um bass. When when these are being used as are like suppose as are recommended, you would get more bass in like deep, deep like below 100 hertz hertz by using boundary gain, um, and and so this is anechoic, right? And so this is not what you have in a room. You you get more deep bass in a room, especially if you follow the guidelines by the uh, manufacturer. But like that 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 mid bass hump, I wish they'd like like kind of taper that down a little bit because that's in so many speakers. I, I always hear it, you know. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad, right? Um, but it's it's in so many speakers, I just can't help but hear it. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it's you could there. you could probably EQ that down a little bit if you want. Yeah, it's, you know? it's very easily EQ'd. You know, but I mean, yeah, if you if you have it, it, it that would be easy to EQ down, pretty easy. So like, but um, it, it's there if you don't EQ it. Um, so is the shape is the is the roll off of the speaker like a traditional fourth order enclosure, or is it a little more shallow? It looks like it looks like second order, doesn't it? It looks like yeah. a twelve dB per octave. And I, I was think trying that, to look at it like I don't know if I'm looking at it clearly enough or Yeah, I don't I don't I don't fully understand it. It's almost like I think the isobark is loading is doing something that like it underdamps it or something, right? Yeah, like like because yeah, I don't I don't understand. I know the isobark system is I know the front woofer isn't loading the port and and, and it sees like uh on a, 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 like a roll off that you wouldn't have like a, a second order roll off because it's it's like in a sealed it's a sealed speaker right in the front woofer so only the back woofer is loading the port so i think you get kind of a combination of like a port a port output but also a sealed roll off because of the the, right. the way the isobaric system is built and um it's kind of interesting it's kind of cool actually i i i I'm surprised I haven't seen it more. I mean, it's 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 useful. So well, I mean, probably because it's much more expensive to engineer a system like this as opposed to just using a single woofer. You know, now you got two woofers. You got to kind of seal those two together. You got to make sure they work well together. I mean, it's just it's more of a complicated system than just using one woofer. That's definitely true. I mean, I, you I wouldn't expect to see this on a budget speaker, but for high end speakers, it looks like it it could do the job. You know, it could. I think Andrew Jones have done it on some of his. Um, the speakers he worked with with ELAC, I remember having him talk about a woofer inside the cabinet that was firing with another woofer, almost like an isobaric. I, I could be wrong, but I thought I remember hearing about that maybe four or five years ago. I think he did that with like the Andante line. I think mm -hmm. that was a, ELAC. That was a kind of their higher end line. But yeah. um, I, my my memory isn't. Don't, I don't take that to the bank. <laughs> yeah, so like yeah, it's been done before. It's just not very common. Uh, um, Monoacoustic does. Did. You do your measurements at one meter or two meters. This is one meter. Um, actually, the the low frequencies, the ground plane is two meters. The, the right, ground, but the, but the ones you do on the platform are at a meter, right? Well, it depends. You have to it depends like, on the speaker. It depends on the speaker. So you have to you want it to get as close as you can where the drive the sounds of the drivers integrate. But you you have you um. That, that that depends on the speaker for like, for like a large tower speaker the 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 dri the sound of each driver will integrate at a further distance for a smaller speaker it'll happen at a very close distance like for this it would happen yeah. closer than one meter i mean I, I measured at one meter but you could probably measure this at three fourths of the meter, maybe even half a meter and that that would work for the speaker but for like a tower speaker you might need to measure as far back as two meters three meters you know um so it depends on the speaker you just got to find that distance you want to you want to have a standard like measurement distance to keep everything comparable. So for bookshelf speakers, I always do like one meter, and for tower speakers, I do two meters. Yeah, and then if you ever want to compare them, you can SPL scale them too to compensate for the distance differences. Yeah, yeah. The, now this this is the uh, impedance. This is a weird graph. There's nothing really really off or wrong about this, but it's strange. Well, and the port is this it only has one saddle point, right? It only has one peak, I should say. It doesn't have the Well, it does. I guess it does have the second one, but it's really small. Yeah, it's it's just weird. <laughs> it's not bad. I mean, I I like you're not going to run I guess you don't want to this says that you don't want to run this speaker on a really cheap amp. 
you know, because it does dig dig down almost two. Oh my ohms. god, two ohms, five yeah. kilohertz. But that's yeah. that. Like five kilohertz is not a region that's like you're gonna most content puts a lot of energy in, so that's not like that big of a deal, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's a four ohm speaker. It, it's um, you don't want to run. Don't use really don't use this on a two hundred dollar Sony receiver, please. I'll be honest. I've, a two hundred dollars Sony receiver could probably run this speaker without problems. You, you probably, but you know, nobody who buys a, like these luxury speakers are going to run it with an a, a amp like that. But it's yeah, not a big deal. It's just it's a little strange. But like the Isobark system, it has a different profile, a different impedance profile than what you normally see. And this is this is what it looks like. So it's uh it's unusual. <laughs> it's not bad. It's just not. Uh, it's just it's showing the electrical load is not normal for the speaker so yeah so you can go to the next slide yeah okay let's wrap this up i guess it's so like the pros this speaker the like we said the, the build quality is you can't you can't buy a better build small speaker you can't if you want the best built desktop speaker or, or small speaker this is it and, it's, and for, for the cost it's not really that that expensive if you want the very best of something right it's like it's crazy it's like it's crazy well built, you know. It, I think it looks really nice. It's one of the nicer speakers I've ever had. Um, the imaging is excellent. I mean, we, I guess we didn't go into the subjective stuff, but like yeah. Um, so basically, that's why I wanted to wanted you on here. Most of the listening you did was in a desktop environment, right? I did some, yeah, in my theater room, but yeah, most was on a desktop where it's kind of a supposed to be used, and it, it the image is amazing, you know, as it should because like it's. Kind of like a point source it's like most just it's mostly just the woofer doing the talking and the feeder is adding some trouble like we said it's almost like a super tweeter right so mm -hmm. like it's like the, so so point sourcey when it's like that you know it's like a, a single like wide band wide range driver and like that ought to have really really good imaging and these do um the the sound even though this is using an amt tweeter and a steep waveguide the the trouble is not very like it's not hot trouble. This is a warm. This speaker has a warm sound, I would say. So it, it's pretty laid back. Um, uh, so if you want that, these can these can these have that. I mean, if you can always EQ that though. If you want hot trouble, just boost the tweeter. You know, boost the tweeter's bandwidth. And the, the equalizer. You know, and as as we said before, um, these could last a really long time. This is a true heirloom like product. You know, if you want. To like buy something that you could hand down to your kids. Well, if you take care of these, these will these are something you could like pass on to like you know your future generations. You know, so like they're that well built. You know, yeah. So, uh, and uh, the cons, yeah. The, I mean, the the bin base size. That's not my taste. It's not that offensive, but like um, I I like I'd rather it would be it was a flat response down there. But most people like kind of like that, and that's why that so many manufacturers voice these speakers to like to have that mid base bump. You know. The yep. recess treble, I don't mind the recess treble, but that won't be to everyone's taste. You know, I, I kind of like that quality. I like a warmer speaker. That's my own preference. And like maybe if you want hot, crispy treble, these aren't the speakers for you. But then again, you can always EQ them. You can just boost the treble in an equalizer if that's what you wanted. And the, the, another kind, they're, they're expensive. I don't think they're a bad value considering the build quality, but they're a thousand dollars each. And like, that's not, you know, for a little desktop speaker, that's kind of. <laughs> Not a small expenditure for most people, you know. So that is what it is. I can envision, like, if this is in the South Korean market, I can envision them putting in like this kind of modern room and kind of have them out as a center or conversational piece, you know, that blends into the decor of their room. And and when you think about that, it's kind of like buying a fine watch. You're not buying the watch to tell the time any better. You're buying it for the aesthetics of it. And there's a factor of cost, of course, that's involved with that. Yeah, the speaker could be made cheaper with wooden cabinets, but it won't give you that same look and that same feel. And that I would imagine this has a really high pride of ownership when you have something that is crafted the way this is. Oh, big time. I mean, a lot of audio products are like that. A lot of audio products. I mean, some people will, you know, we've had guys who will poo-poo a product just because it's like, it looks nice or it's expensive to, to look nice. You know, like, well, I could buy, uh, you know, a $500 studio monitor that could you know, sound as good as these, like, you know, X speaker that costs many thousands of dollars, right? Well, then that's not why people are buying a luxury product like this. It's not just for how it 
function is it's for how it looks how it feels and like the like you said the pride of ownership i mean this thing is like you know so like if that doesn't matter to you then yeah buy some like uh studio monitor though from like uh unexpensive studio monitor yeah it, it'll have it'll sound good but it's not gonna like look or feel nice you know it's it's not gonna like complement the room so much unless you're you have like a studio recording studio you know or it doesn't matter mm -hmm. but yeah so like um i guess the conclusion going on to the conclusion it's a small but high-end luxury speaker it's a niche market these are niche speakers it's not this is gonna have this thing i can have like a really wide appeal or at least like really expensive desktop or small room speaker that's a niche market but if you're looking for that these are these will fit the bill really nicely um like i said play with vertical angling for to get your the sound that's right for you back wall bass reinforcement to show up the the bass if you're not using a subwoofer the, i think your subwoofers do improve the sound i mean i mon acoustics would probably argue against that but that was my experience you know um for, for competing. You cannot change the laws of physics, even if you have the isobaric load. At the end of the day, it's still a four-inch driver. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, if you, if they just don't do deep bass below, like, depending on how much room gain you get, you're, you're probably not going to get a lot of bass below like 70, 60 hertz. And so, like, that you're just gonna there's just gonna be no deep bass unless you use a subwoofer. You know. Mm -hmm. But but a lot of like acoustic music, especially, just doesn't have much deep bass at all. So like, if you're listening to like you know, like guitar, acoustic guitar recordings or just some vocals or something these, these will catch all of that fine it has enough bass extension for all of that it's just if you listen to like bass heavy like electronic music or pipe organ music this you can want to sell with these so yeah so, so just I, a couple of a couple of uh points here i'll put up on the screen from people that are watching can you use them as bed layers of surrounds uh sure i guess you can it's kind of overkill in terms of getting something that's crafted like this and the price it is there's definitely more cost effective options. I, I envision this speaker is, as something that's set up in a two channel environment and as a conversational piece, not so much as a home theater environment, just simply because they don't even have a whole home theater line solution. They just have basically right now, I think two products, right? They in the have United this States. Product, in the in United, the United States. States, yeah. So I would use this more as a two-channel, really high-performance two-channel desktop system, maybe add a sub with it, get a nice high-quality streaming DAC, and just go to town and enjoy yourself, especially for people that work a lot at their computer. Um, I'd love to have a speaker like this on my desktop. I think it just changes your whole mood. You know, you know what, Gene? I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to say, go ahead and use them as bed surrounds because that would be a killer little, like a really nice little home theater system. You could use these as surrounds and they, I mean, they're overkill for sure. Right. You don't need to spend that mm -hmm. much, but, but in the right, like kind of home theater, they would look, it would look pretty cool to have like a, like a surround sound system made with some mon acoustic speaker, maybe have the Superman, those like the, the large Superman ISO barks as your front speakers and these as your surrounds. That'd be a pretty cool. Um, a surround sound system i mean if you got the budget do it of course yeah i'm just saying and generally speaking this is more I, I see this more as a two channel oh yeah kind of, for sure uh, yeah for sure um yeah here's I another like one um how do they compare to bookshelves in the 5 to 10k range well i mean you're, if you're looking at speakers in the 5 to 10k range they're going to be a lot larger than this right so this is kind of its own category just because of the diminutive size of what it is yeah, look, you can get a more capable speaker for sure if you have space for them. I mean, these are these are this is getting as much out of a small, uh, compact package as possible. That's what they're trying to do. But yeah, if you can accommodate a larger speaker, yeah, a larger speaker can like it can do way better in lo low frequency extension. You know, will have more um, dynamic range. I mean, if you want a speaker that's hitting 135 dB, I gotta ask why and how how's you hear? <laughs> How's your hearing? Because if you're listening to a speaker at those SPL levels, you probably can't hear much of anything anymore. So be careful. Well, when well, Gene, I, I don't know. If you took the speaker and you put it right next to your ear and you- Yeah, you then you'll like, hit that 135. At what distance does it matter? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, for like one centimeter away, you, they might do that. So yeah, these could be the speakers for you if you, if you want to use them as headphones, you know? So like- <laughs> That would be good, you know, like like neck neck exercises, you know, building neck muscle to use them as headphones. Like put a strap. I'm on I'm just them, thinking, you know? like if if you can't go to the gym one day and you need something to to work out with, you can use that, hold it up like this, and do deadlifts or squats or. You know, there, shoulder there, there are something like 11 pounds for a small package. That is 
that's a lot. That's actually that's not. You could use yeah. them for exercise weights if you if you really wanted. You know, do it for forearms maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's for like I mean not for you that wouldn't be much, but for like you know somebody who you know, for me that's like doing that all day would be really really um taxing. I don't know. You've been lifting all those heavy speakers on that platform. I got to give you a lot of credit for that, James. And oh, round geez. of applause as well, man. Yeah. You see, these weren't so bad for that. These aren't easy to handle. Or yeah. Both of them. yeah. So yeah, I get, you know, I get, I should say one thing, these speakers, I, I think they make more sense in like a small study. Like I know in Korea where they're, you know, they're bigger. Um, there's not a lot of space in those apartments, right? They don't have as much yeah. like in the United States, we have much larger houses and much larger, you know, we have way more room. But for, for if you like if you live in like a small uh, I don't know apartment or whatever you know these make these make uh, a lot more sense there and so they're bigger in Korea than than you would expect them to be in the United States but if, still if you want like a really nice luxury office system you know or dust system these these do that you know so like just just add that there why these things are would be more popular in Korea than the United States where you have a lot yeah. more real estate to work with. So yeah. Yeah, a good point. Yeah, definitely. Well, James, thanks for the overview. Guys, we have a written review that's linked in the video below. So you could go and look at James's whole experience with the product. He gets into the details of the design of it. He also does his listening test with both mu mu music and movies. So you got kind of a wide range of source material that's all in the review. And um, yeah, and I think you're going to be doing another review for them. I think you're looking at their, their bigger version of the speaker that's coming up next yeah we're, we're gonna review the um isobarics which i mean this is an isobaric speaker but the, their main speaker in the united states is called the superman isobark and it's it's like a it's a good size bookshelf speaker also made out of aluminum it's 80 pounds it's nice. um it's considerably more expensive those are twenty five thousand a pair so like we'll be looking at those so that i don't know when i'll be done with that hopefully in a month or two i don't know We'll yeah. hopefully we'll look at that online by the end of the year. But that's an interesting speaker as well. So, you know, stay tuned for that one. Yeah. And guys, last thing, a bit of a uh, news item for Audioholics. We are right now running a contest for Arendelle Sound, the 1961 Towers. I'll link it in the video description below. Arendelle is going to be on a live stream on November 15th, and that's when they're going to announce the winner. So you have a few more days. You've got, you literally have two more days to enter this contest. It's global. It's not just restricted to the United States, and they will be announcing the winner. So definitely try to get involved in that. And guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or you want to just give us some questions that you have need answers to. James, again, thanks for uh, all this information and showcasing this product to us, Mon Acoustics. Sure, no problem. All right, guys. Until next time, my friends, keep listening.